Hello, everyone. We're glad to have Dr. Bill Mullen with us. Bill Mullen is a professor of English and American Studies at Purdue University. He has been a Fulbright lecturer at Wuhan University in China. His articles have appeared in Social Text, African American Review, American Quarterly, Modern Fiction Studies, and Jacobin. His books include Un American, W.E.B. Du Bois, and The Central World uh, Revolution, Afro Orientalism, and Popular Fronts, Chicago and African American Cultural Politics. Mullen teaches courses in African American literature and culture, American studies, working class uh, literature, cultural studies, and post colonial literature. And today he's here with us to talk about his latest book, James Baldwin, Living in Fire, which focuses on James Baldwin political life. Bill, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Matez. I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let us start talking about James Baldwin, a figure uh, who's Whose, whose significance and legacy will never be forgotten in the world and made a huge impact on a lot of activists. Uh, I'd like to talk about some aspects of his books, uh, so, some aspects of his life that are lesser known. And uh, when I read your book, there were some really fascinating facts about him that I re did not know. Uh, let us start with his childhood. He was born in extreme poverty and uh, he really had a tough time during his childhood, but uh, he also had uh, this, his teacher, Orilla Miller, who had a huge, huge influence on him. Tell us a little bit about his childhood and also the influence that his teacher had on him. Sure, he, uh, he was born in, in Harlem in 1924 as very poor working class family. His father was a, worked at a bottle factory. Uh, his mother was a, a domestic worker, uh, like many black women at that time. He also uh, had seven siblings. Um, he was he was um, he didn't he never knew his own biological birth father, so he lived and grew up with his uh, his his mother's second husband, and he had a very complicated relationship to him. Uh, he his father was a, a because of the kind of racial and economic oppression he lived under. He learned a lot about racism in the United States just from watching his his dad try to try, try to survive, and similarly um, drew inspiration from his mother's kind of relentless, you know, uh, desire and and work to raise to raise those children. Um, he, I think, for him, you know, reading reading and writing were ways out of hardship for him. By the time he was about ten years old. He was already kind of a prolific reader. Um, he began to, you know, find books wherever he could find them. And you mentioned Orilla Miller. Um, when he was 13, uh, she became uh, his teacher. Um, she was a white woman, and she was actually a radical. She was a, a member of the Communist Party of the United States. And she took a special interest in, in uh, Baldwin because she realized he was precocious and, and brilliant. And you know they would sit sit around at, together and talk about like Charles Dickens novels, and I think being recognized by a teacher and a, and a white woman uh, at, in the 1930s in a place like Harlem meant a lot to him. You know, he later said, not only did she encourage me to read, she took him to to movies. He became a lifelong movie fan because she would take him to see the great cinema of, of the day. But he said, you know, because of her influence, he said, I could never really fully hate white people, even though he said a lot of times I wanted to kill them for what they were doing to me. So, you know, race and education kind of like took on really special meaning for him as a child. And uh, he, his high school years were, uh, he, he worked for the creative writing magazine at his high school. Um, he definitely des desired pretty early in his life to be a, be become a creative writer, um, had some encouragement from teachers there. Um, County Cullen, who was actually a poet of the Harlem Renaissance, was one of his English professors when he was in high school. He's pretty lucky to have that influence. And then, uh, and then the church was a gigantic influence. And I write about this in the book. If, if, you, if people are watching have read his his great book, Go Tell It on the Mountain, which is really a kind of a, 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 an autobiographical novel about a young boy growing up in a Pentecostal church like Baldwin did, whose father wants him to become a, a preacher. And that was actually true of Baldwin's own father, who was himself a preacher. And 
Baldwin really wrestled with religion. I mean, it was much of his writing is informed by, you might call Chris, aspirations within Christianity towards um, higher forms of knowledge and spiritual understanding. At the same time, he felt an outsider in the church. And, and this had to do, I think, partly with his, his, his alienation from his dad and his desire to kind of be his own man, as it were. Um, but he was also aware of his emerging uh, sexuality, you know, and the protagonist, uh, 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 John Grimes, of his first novel is clearly like filled with homoerotic desire, and it comes across beautifully in the novel. But Baldwin knew that wasn't going to fly very well in, in his church, and he knew it wasn't going to be easy in his family if he actually were to pursue these impulses. So as soon as he graduated high school, he also broke with the church, uh, left Harlem, moved to Greenwich Village, and started to, I, I suppose, live the life of an artist, uh, a man ex willing to explore his sexuality. It was a huge turning point from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. Uh, and, and for me, that chapter of his life is full of themes that you know he explored later on in his books. Yeah, and and he does write about church in that wonderful essay, uh, "Fire Next Time." Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read somewhere, don't remember where it was exactly, about the influence of his teachers. Uh, there was this critic. I'm not sure where I read it. That even during 1970s, uh, with McCarthyism and this witch hunt for communism, lots of lots of teachers lost their jobs, and uh, you can imagine how 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 many other James Baldwin's could have been. Could have been nurtured yeah. or born in the United States. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a an interesting theme, you know, that I explore more than other writers. I mean, when he was living in New York in the 1940s, um, he met up with you know socialist groups who tried to recruit him, uh, particularly members of the Trotskyist movement in the United States, and he was friends with a a, a guy named Stan Weir. And um, Baldwin's understanding of capitalism and its inequalities was, was partly shaped by his encounter with, with socialist perspective in the 1940s. Um, later on in his writing in the 1970s, you know, he called himself a socialist. Um, even though his socialism, I would say, was kind of idiosyncratic, he never joined a socialist organization. But the, relation, the, 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 the role of capitalism and producing poverty and producing racism were things he wrote about constantly in his work. And I think that that, that encounter with, with an anti-capitalist perspective in the 1940s was really important. He also, you know, because he was influenced by the Trotskyist movement, um, he was strongly opposed to US participation in World War II, which was somewhat of a unique position given that America was fighting fascists, fascists but the Trotskyist movement um, took the position that the US participation in the war, that it was an imperialist war. And uh, the US and Germany and France were all acting as imperialist powers, despite the fact that they were fighting fascism. And that perspective, his opposition to, to American wars carried through for the rest of his life, including through the Vietnam War in the 1960s, where he became you know, a very, very strong, powerful uh, critic of that war. So that was another, I think, element of his education, his political education early in his life, which for my, to my reading of him was really, really important. Thank you. And uh, I think he called this version of the version, he, he identified with Black Panther's version of socialism and you have talked about it in the book that he, that he was advocating for an indigenous kind of socialism which he yes. called the yankee doodle uh, yes. socialism <laughs> yeah which by which he meant uh by which he meant uh a, a socialism that was rooted in understanding the particular dynamics of things like race and racism the history of slavery in the united states the history of jim crow segregation um uh for him, he said, he said if, if I'm going to be a socialist, my socialism is gonna to have to take up all of those themes. 
and he and he said that partly because one reason he never joined the socialist movement in the 1940s, even the even the Trotskyist movement, there were very few African Americans in those organizations, and he actually felt that the socialist movement in the United States historically had not sufficiently taken up questions of race and racism. And there's a lot of truth and as well as debate about that. But for, for Baldwin, a Yankee doodle socialist would have to be a socialist who would say that the fight against racism has to be really fundamental to any kind of criticism of, of capitalism. Uh, let us talk about his uh his years abroad uh, outside the United States. I think it was the suicide of one of his closest friends, uh, which kind of instigated him to leave the United States. And uh, we know a lot about his years in Paris and other places, but he spent about 10 years in Turkey, which had a huge influence on his uh, life and his also intellectual life as well. And he did mention somewhere that uh, Turkey saved me. So can you tell us a little right. about his years in Turkey and how his encounter with the, with the Muslim majority population there um, influenced his life and thinking? Yeah, that's really a great question. Um, well, first I'll say there's a wonderful, a lot of people who, who know James Baldwin's life and work don't know that he spent almost 10 years living in Istanbul. He bought a house there and he would come in and out uh, over that 10 year period between traveling to the United States and, and sometimes spending time in Paris. And there's a wonderful book <clears throat> just about Baldwin's time in Paris by a, a scholar named Magdalena Zaborowska called The Erotics of Exile. And I would highly recommend it for people who want to get a deep, do a deep dive into his day-to-day -day life in, uh, in, in, in Istanbul during that time. <clears throat> what I, I found several things really fascinating for, for me about Baldwin and, and Istanbul. He went there um, after he had gone to Israel um, for the first time. <clears throat> he had, had intended to go to Africa, but he had made friends with an, a, a Turkish actor named Engin Cesar. And he had met him in New York about 1959, 1960. Baldwin at one point, Baldwin wrote plays, wrote several brilliant plays, but at one point in his life wanted to be an actor and he was studying acting. And he met Engin and he convinced him, he said, well, you know, why don't you come to Turkey and, and, and spend time with me and my wife and we'll show you around. Well, he did. And um, he immediately felt, from my perspective, when you said he saved my life, Baldwin was at a, a pressure point in his life. He was, um, he was becoming a celebrity. Um, he, was, he was in demand uh, in the United States as a, as a writer and as a commentator. And Baldwin's part of Baldwin was always seeking kind of privacy from the spotlight. Istanbul allowed him that, you know, it was so far away from America. Americans weren't paying attention to what was going on in Istanbul. He felt like he could a bit kind of blend in and hide there in a way. Um, that, that's one reason I think he, he found some relief from, from his public life there. He also didn't really know much about the history of Turkey, or he and he hadn't really studied, for example, the history of the Ottoman Empire, and he began to to adopt a perspective on the Western world that included an understanding of things like the history of of Islam and Muslims and uh, countries like Turkey, and so it can, when he went to Paris, he said, you know, I saw America totally differently because of the fact that I was away from it. You know, that's what e Edward Said said, the person who lives in exile has a deeper vision sometimes of what his homeland means, right? And uh, Said loved Baldwin, I think partly for that reason. But I think when he got to Turkey and he was living in, as you say, in a Muslim majority country, he was really trying to understand why was it that this guy called Malcolm X in the United States was, it, a member of the nation of Islam was using Islam to advance an understanding of black liberation in the United States, because the nation of Islam was arguing, especially to working class black men, that Christianity was a lie, that it was the religion of slavery, that Islam was a global black man's religion, that it was practiced across Africa and across the Middle East. 
Well, suddenly Baldwin was in the Middle East and he was living among Muslims every day. And he was, I think it really helped him understand the truth, some of the truths of what people like Malcolm X were saying, that there were alternatives to uh, Christian dominated societies like America. Um, he also, I think, came to understand the way in which Islam had been demonized by Christianity historically. Um, he, write, he has this beautiful book called No Name in the Street, which he writes actually partly when he's in Istanbul. And um, he says, you know, if you go back to the 15th century in Europe and you look at the expulsion of, the, of Jews and, and Muslims from Spain, he says, you're, what you're beginning to see is Christianity rising while Judaism and Islam are being kind of blackened, right? And demonized by the rise of a Christian Western imperialist um, uh, uh, history. And that insight, I think, meant something different to him living in a place like Istanbul, right? Where he was, he was sensing, sensing history differently too. So that to me was another turning point. And then the third thing I would say about his time in Turkey, and this is really what Magdalena Zaboraska explores. Um, Baldwin was gay. He, he, I think he left the United States in 1948 partly because he felt it would be easier and more comfortable for him to live as a gay man in Paris. And I think he had a similar feeling about his e the ease of living a as a gay black man in Istanbul, partly because of his, his relative anonymity. He wasn't known the same way there, partly because he met and was part friends with gay and lesbian men and women in Istanbul who accepted him. He also was continued his uh, interest in theater. Uh, he wanted to uh, direct plays. And when he was in Istanbul, he actually directed a play called Fortune in Men's Eyes, which was one of the first plays of that period to openly deal with questions of homosexuality. And he threw himself into that project and the play to his great surprise was a huge success. It was celebrated by the Turkish theater community. That meant a lot to him. And I think, I think, I, I, I think, I don't, I'm not sure Baldwin uh, would have felt he could have done the same thing if he was living in New York. So Tur Istanbul gave him a special opportunity to explore dimensions of his life that were really, really important to him. So those are some of the things that I think were, um, as you say, things that helped save his life or uh, put him in touch with himself, right? As a, as a person, as a writer, as an artist um, that, that he couldn't have found uh, back in the US. Thank you. Excellent explanation about his years in Istanbul. And as you said, it's a fact that is uh, lesser known about him. Mm -hmm. uh, the what you said about his play in Turkey reminded me of uh, black artists or Harlem Harlem Renaissance in general that they had a difficult they had difficulty difficulty producing the art in the United States and for a period of time uh, Soviet Union was very supportive of black artists and invited some of them to the to mainly for ideological reasons right. of course uh, with Soviet propaganda machine uh, I think Baldwin also did go to Moscow am I right. Uh, no, um, no, I don't he think he never, he yeah. never made it to Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, I think it's something he would have liked to have done, but uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't a place he was he was able to visit. Yeah, I saw a picture, but I didn't know if he had visited there, uh, Moscow or not. But thank you. Uh, now, uh, another fact that I did not know before reading your book was uh, his uh, trip to Israel, and he made a very interesting comment about living in uh, Jerusalem. Um, mm. And I also watched one of your interviews uh, that you talked about uh, the great Palestinian writer, Ghassan Kanafani. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us about his comments and, and what, how he viewed Zionism in general. And mm. um, his, his comments about Jerusalem, that if he decided to live there. And also, do you see any similarity? Because when I, when I, I've read parts of some, some of some works of Ghassan Kanafani, and I do see the characters both as being really radical characters you know fighting for freedom and justice yeah that's a great question thank you for asking it um 
I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a full answer because I was, because I am myself someone who's very interested in Palestinian liberation issues. Um, I wanted to really think about how James Baldwin um, thought about things like Israel. And uh, it's true that when he was a young man in the 30s and the 40s, many Jewish friends, uh, he had um, some of the some of the writers and editors who helped champion his work with journals like Partisan Review were what were called called the New York Jewish intellectuals. Baldwin came to understand American racism partly by understanding anti-Semitism. He saw it firsthand, right? And he rejected it. It was one reason that um, I think the idea of going to Israel in 1961 had, had some appeal to him. He, there were, there were, if you were a, a, a radical or a progressive in the US in the 1940s and the 50s, many people saw Israel as kind of a liberation project, right? The Jews were going to find a homeland, which is something African Americans could relate to. Um, people like Paul Robeson and W. E. B. Du Bois, who were leading figures, had all championed the the founding of the state of Israel. Um, Baldwin was part of that generation, and I think uh, came to, was 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 interested in the idea of going to Israel himself. He was actually invited by the government um, because of his celebrity and because he was a well known writer. And I think there was probably a, an attempt by, by the state of Israel to also use Baldwin for propaganda purposes. But what's interesting about Baldwin and makes him a little different, and I think this has to do with his political education. He was exposed to the Trotskyist movement in the 1940s. They actually understood the state of Israel as a Zionist project. And they understood more than other left groups like the Communist Party that Palestinians were there and that this was a colonial project. And I think Baldwin had that understanding in his mind too. And when he goes to Israel and he writes this very, he says, well, you know, I, I, I thought about going to live in, in uh, Israel permanently, but I decided to go to Paris instead because he said, if I had moved to, to Israel, which side of Jerusalem would I have lived on? Well, meaning he understood it had already been partitioned as it was by the United Nations in 1948. He understood, he understood it as a kind of segregated society. And he implicitly understood that Palestinians were the, the oppressed minority in that situation. So it's a really interesting comment for him to make. And when he goes to Israel, He's actually in the middle, he's carrying the manuscript in his briefcase for his great book, The Fire Next Time. And that book is about the racial fire burning in America, right? And he said, when I was in Israel, he says, I felt like I was back in the fire next time. Meaning when he walked around Israel and saw the fences and the gates and the partitions and the separation, it reminded him of what we call in America Jim Crow, that this was a, a racially segregated world, right? So that experience, I think, opened up for him uh, questions about Zionism as an ideology um, and began an exploration, a deeper exp engagement, not just with Palestinians, but to link it to his Paris experience, to the, to the place of Arabs in, in the world. He was in Paris in 1954 when the Algerian revolution begins. Um, he spends a night in jail in 1955. He's falsely accused of stealing a, a bed sheet. And he writes this incredible essay called Equal in Paris. And he says, man, he says, when I got into a French jail, everybody looked like me. And what he was seeing were dark-skinned North Africans from places like Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, who he said were clearly like the oppressed prisoners of this society. You know, meaning if I was back in New York in jail, most of the people would have been black, right? So going to Israel, encountering what was what the Palestinians had experienced, thinking about what he had seen in Paris with the Algerians struggling against uh, French colonialism, all these things began to bubble up in his mind in the 1960s after his visit to Israel. 
1966, when the Black Panther Party is formed in the United States, they're one of the first groups in America to say that Israel is a colonial Zionist state. And other groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was a group that, you know, a lot of your like viewers will know as the, the students who organized lunch counter, you know, protests in the South, they also uh, begin to make a public argument that uh, Zionism is, is racism and Zionism is colonialism. Baldwin immediately understands that argument and, uh, it, and supports both the Black Panther and SNCC. And if you look at his writings from 1966 to about 1972, when he writes this great book called No Name in the Street, this is exactly the argument he makes. He says that if you're going to, if you're going to want to understand racism in America and, a, and American imperialism, look at Israel and look what's happened to the Palestinians. It's very much like what's happened to, to my people uh, at home, right? Um, and he, and he continues in the 1970s to, to make these arguments. He writes an essay in the late 1970s, um, basically saying there will be no peace in the Middle East until Palestinians are uh, given uh, a, a voice in, in the process, right? So I think that's a really, really important feature of Baldwin's work um, that, that needs to be explored further because um, in the last you know 15 years in the United States, I think some people have finally began to have begun to understand um, what life for Palestinians is like, you know, in Israel and uh, and why we call it an apartheid state. So I would say Baldwin was one of the first American writers of the 20th century to really begin to make that theme clear. And um, it, to me, it's a very important element of his work. Yeah, thank you. And just as you mentioned, this is a very important aspect of his work that has not really been explored. And uh, I personally loved um, Baldwin, but I did not know about that. I think with Edward Said, you know, more and more writers started to talk about Palestine and Israel. But before Edward Said, as I have rightly mentioned, uh, Baldwin uh, made this really, really progressive statement. Yeah, you, and I, I want to, I'm sorry, I wanted to uh, respond to your part of the question about Ghassan yeah, Kanafani. Yeah. Um, the, um, I do see similarities be between them. Um, they were roughly of the same generation, you know. Um, they were both shaped by what I would call the problem of colonialism. Um, for Kanafani, it's growing up uh, Palestinian, uh, surviving the Nakba of 1948, right? Um, which, by the way, is interesting to me. That's the year that Baldwin leaves America. You know, the same year of the Nakba, the same year of the, the founding of Israel. And in fact, you know, I think that Baldwin's leaving America was in his own way kind of rejecting American colonial history, right? He wanted to be, uh, he wanted to be away from a country, as Kanafani would understand, that he felt was trying to kill him. You know, Baldwin said, if I didn't leave America, I was either going to kill somebody else because of all the anger I was feeling about racism in America, or I was going to kill myself. Um, so 1948 is a year in which Israel is partitioned, Kanafani, you know, uh, goes, goes through the experience of the Nakba, dedicates the rest of his life to becoming an artist and a writer and a spokesperson, you know, for Palestinian liberation. That's James Baldwin, you know, that's when James Baldwin arrived by the 1950s. And I think a turning point for Baldwin to compare to Kanafani, kind of, he never went through a Nakba, but when Baldwin saw black people being beaten in the streets of the South in 1955 and 1957 and 1958, when he knew about Emmett Till being lynched uh, by a white mob in, in the South, when he saw you know, uh, black children beaten for trying to integrate schools, he was living in Paris when this happened, but he came back and he came back to write about it and to join the protest. And from 1955 to 1965, he was constantly marching, whether it was in Paris or here in the United States, he was, in the civil rights movement. Uh, 
Um, Khanafani's civil rights movement was his participation in the in the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. You know, the the Marxist um, radical organization that he committed his life to. And uh, Khanafani said something about writing, which really resonated with me uh, as it relates to Baldwin. He said, "The purpose of my writing, and it is to express my." in all of my writing is to find a way to express my political ideas, even in his brilliant fiction writing. He was a journalist, of course. And another thing that makes him like Baldwin, they were they wrote in different genres. Baldwin was a journalist. He wrote for the Nation magazine. He wrote for the New Yorker. Kanafani was a journalist, but they also wrote fiction. They also wrote poetry. They tried to use all of the um, uh, literary modes that were available to them to talk about the struggle of their people. And um, uh, when, when I gave a talk about Kanafani uh, and Baldwin, I used that quote where Kanafani uh, uh, talks about the responsibility of, of the writer to use, um, to use their writing for political purposes. And Baldwin said, you know, something almost identical. He said, the artist is a revolutionary. He has to see things and say things that other people cannot say. So this, for me, there's an enormous amount of comparison. And maybe the last point would be, um, they were enemies of the state, of their states, right? Kanafani, as many people know, was assassinated by the Mossad, Israeli intelligence, because he was considered such a threat, um, as was the PFLP. Um, Baldwin was, was Baldwin uh, was surveilled by the by the FBI. He, he has all nearly 2,000 page FBI file, and it started about 1960 when he was speaking favorably about the Cuban Revolution. He was writing about the Nation of Islam. He was gay. That actually really scared the FBI. You, you know, the director of the FBI said, "Isn't Baldwin a well-known pervert?" I mean, to be a gay man, we forget, you know, 60 years ago in America during the Cold War was also its own, its own risk. So they were targeted by the state, by, by, by the states in which they opposed. And I think they were both heroic in opposing those states, you know, very, very openly saying, I am going to risk my life and my, and, and limb um, to try to bring truth to to the world, so I think they're two of the bravest writers that uh, that lived in the in the twentieth century. Thank you. At excellent points and uh, analogy between the two writers, and you also touched upon a lot of um, other uh, subjects that I wanted to talk about, like the FBI mm -hmm. files and um, and James Baldwin, and uh, yeah, they were both considered to be the enemies of the states. Uh, and I do like to talk about Malcolm X as well, because um, that's an also a subject that you talk about in the book. They had the differences. I guess uh, James Baldwin was critical of the Nation of Islam because of their militant rhetoric. And um, you have quoted uh, right. James Baldwin that they are reproducing the uh, the logic of separatism or the white logic, the, the logic of white supremacy, but only in reverse. But later on, after the assassination of Malcolm X, he became more sympathetic right. to 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 the nation of islam so tell us a little about his adventure with malcolm x yeah that's a great question um but in the, in the late 1950s i would say baldwin was kind of a liberal integrationist um there, there's an element of james baldwin which is always for integration because he said you know everybody in america carries everybody else's blood White people might think they're just white, they're not. Black people might just think they're black, they're not. And, and uh, in the late 50s, he was, I think he was still convinced that integration was possible. Malcolm, X, Malcolm X's line uh, in the Nation of Islam was that integration was a failure uh, and that black, black people should take their political lives into their own hands. Baldwin thought this was separatism. He thought that black people were separating themselves, that Malcolm X was calling for separation of the races. And he worried that 
this would reproduce a different kind of racial hierarchy that would be black over white. And this had to do with what I would call some somewhat misguided ideas that people like Elijah Muhammad put forward that, um, you know, the, the white people were descended from black ancestors that had been demonically bleached. Um, and Baldwin didn't really agree with that perspective. But, um, and he debated Malcolm X, you know, he debated him publicly, uh, even on television. But when he sat down, when he, when he interviewed Elijah Muhammad for The Fire Next Time, and then he actually wrote the book, what he understood were two things that yes, Islam was a demonized religion and that Christianity had played a horrible role, right? In uh, fostering institutions like slavery. Um, he also understood because he grew up in a poor community like Harlem, why Malcolm X's message of black self liberation, liberate yourself, take your own power, really meant a lot to the most disempowered people. And this is what he writes in the, in the fire next time, right? He said, I'm not in the nation of Islam, but if I was a poor black man in New York City or Chicago and Malcolm X came to speak, his message would make a lot of sense to me. And it started to make him think politics from a slightly different perspective, which was the perspective of the most oppressed uh, members of the black community at that time. He was not, actually, he was a pretty successful writer, but Baldwin always, in my, in my reading of him, was always trying to understand what was the perspective of the subaltern or the most dispossessed person, right? So um, when Malcolm X is, is in fact assassinated, he's absolutely mortified. He's, he's wounded deeply. He's, he's got this great affection for Malcolm X, even despite their earlier disagreements. And, um, and, he, and he writes in, in his book, uh, No Name in the Street, he actually reconsiders his whole relationship to Malcolm X going back 10 years. And he says, you know what? I played the role, I played the white man's role of the good black man who was gonna criticize the bad Malcolm X because Malcolm X was considered by white society a total pariah, right? Like, oh, black separatist, Muslim. And he said, and he said in effect, you know, um, I think, I think I may have gotten some things wrong. And he, he, uh, he argued in, in that book from 1972, that in fact, Malcolm X is, Malcolm X was, was probably a better predictor of the way events were gonna unfold in America than he was. Because by the light, by after his assassination, you have what, what, what became known as the black power movement, right? You had people like Stokely Carmichael saying black power means we do, we free ourselves. We don't call on the white man. We don't rely on the liberal. We take power for ourselves. That was the shift politically after 1965. That's exactly what Baldwin begins to write himself. He says, I'm not going to ask you for my freedom. I'm going to take my freedom. He becomes basically a proponent of black power. And when he, when he takes that position, he's really in a way accepting the fact that Malcolm X probably was right, that we probably have to do this because they're gonna keep killing us. They're gonna kill our leaders. Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968 was devastating for him, just devastating. Um, he, re he really began to think there was no way um, that especially white liberals who I think in the 1950s he believed in were really going to be his, his savior. And um, kind of reminds me of Martin Luther King when he wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail. He said, he said you know, one of, our, uh, one of our enemies is actually liberals who won't, who won't come over and, and, and join our struggle. So their relationship is, is complex, but beautiful. And I, and I think when I say beautiful, I mean, 
Baldwin was always open to reassessing his own thinking. It's one of his great features as a writer. And he really did reassess across, uh, across the 1960s what exactly Malcolm X meant to him and, and to America and decided, as I said, that, um, that there, was an, there was an enormous importance and value to what Malcolm X was trying to, was trying to say. Thank you. Because um, well, 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 before reading your book, a lot of you know the, the discussions about Malcolm X and James Baldwin is actually on that point of difference. But the later mm. um, shift in in, Mar in in James Baldwin's uh, thinking and attitude towards Malcolm X is less talked about. Thanks. And uh, let me ask one final question. Uh, James Baldwin, his uh, fame and his influence. There, there has been this ebb and flow. I think it was at the period in 1990s, maybe that his uh, his influence or let's say his fame started to decline and some people some journalists attributed it to the fact that he never recognized the progress that the united states has made which is a naive statement i personally feel i guess last year proved it with black lives movement and everything but he has come mm -hmm. to uh to 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 the to attention is he's he's let's say his legacy and fame has resurfaced again um tell us a little about that and also i kind of find it um, baffling how James Baldwin is somehow absent from school curriculum. Uh, I'm, right. I'm mainly talking about high schools because there are a lot of American classic novels or writers are taught in high school with universities, a different story. But James Baldwin, it, I, it feels like still a lot of people or teachers or maybe the Board of Education, I don't know, is not comfortable with James Baldwin. He's still a pariah in the educational system mm. when his works. Tell us a little mm. about that, please. Yeah, that's, again, a, a really great question. Um, Baldwin was so famous in the 1960s. You know, he was the first black writer to be on the cover of Time magazine, which you know, which was like the biggest popular mainstream magazine you you could have in, in the United States. He was on television all the time. He was on the Dick Cavett show. He was an enormous public celebrity. Um, as well as a best-selling writer, you know, uh, The Fire Next Time was a huge success as a novel. Even his book, uh, Another Country, which a lot of people don't read, uh, which was published in 1961, sold really, really well. Um, I think a couple of things happened to James Baldwin's reputation that, uh, you know, were things that were really bad and unfair. Um, part of it, it by by the 1970s, the, the the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement have both begun to die die out, right? Literally die out, um, and people are beginning to say, in the mainstream, well, okay, that history is in the past now, and Baldwin got associated with that history because he had written so much about it, so many influential works, so. If America wanted to put civil rights in the rearview mirror, it meant putting James Baldwin in the rearview mirror. Now, of course, that's about America denying, right, that it still has all of these problems that haven't been solved, right? The civil rights movement didn't solve all the problems, nor did the Black Power movement. But that, that I think, happened to Baldwin. A second thing that happened was, you know, after the 1970s, he was he was in Paris more often than he was here in the United States. In the 50s and the 60s, he was here frequently doing journalism, uh, appearing on, on television programs. He spent more time away from the country. He was out of the public eye in a way more after, after the 1970s and into the 1980s. The other thing that started to happen is that his later books, and I'll like, for example, to one of his later novels called Just Above My Head, um, and another one called Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone. They're really, really great books, but they didn't, they were different than his earlier works. They were about African-American families. They didn't, they weren't about so, civil rights. They were more almost like domestic books and they didn't do as well. People didn't find those late Baldwin novels as exciting, as interesting. 
as his earlier work. Well, partly that's because, you know, times make writers and the times of the 60s and the 50s were really Baldwin's times. People didn't quite know what to do with those late books of his. Um, he wrote a whole book of film criticism called The Devil Finds Work, which is great, but it's kind of for film fans. So he was, he was out of the public eye, he was out of the literary eye, and literary critics began to say, well, his best work was obviously a long time ago. He's fading, right? He's a fading writer. Um, and, and so those things combined by about the middle of the 1980s, um, people weren't dismissing James Baldwin. He was, he was just kind of, he was just kind of disappearing. And, and, um, and another thing that happened, and this is kind of, a, this is a tribute to Baldwin too. For, in the 1950s and 60s, there were just a few black writers who really got attention. And Baldwin was probably the most important of them, right? In the 1980s and 70s and 80s, wow, we got all kinds of new black writers coming along. Toni Morrison, this woman, Toni Morrison, publishes her first book in 1972. Um, uh, 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 there, a, a whole uh, Ishmael Reed, you know, uh, people begin to read black writing, a whole range of black writers. So suddenly, in some ways, James Baldwin's not as much of a standout. But what's really interesting about Baldwin, when he died in 1987, guess who spoke at his funeral? All those black writers, like Toni Morrison and Amiri Baraka, and they all said the same thing. I wouldn't have been the writer I am, if not for James Baldwin. And I end with that funeral in my book to say, that's when another part of James Baldwin's legacy was being recognized. Mainstream America might have forgotten him, but black authors and the, the black authors that were going to, to, to go on to become hugely important, they were telling us then, James Baldwin is responsible for me and for us. So. So that's why it's interesting now in the last 10 or 15 years, and I'll get to your question about schools, uh, so many black writers have gone back to, and I mean modern day black writers, have gone back to James Baldwin as a, as a kind of uh, a source of inspiration. And uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, who's, you know, you, you may know and, and your viewers may know is a highly regarded writer, wrote a whole book, um, uh, Between the World and Me, which was partly modeled on The Fire Next Time. Uh, Baldwin wrote that book for his nephew. Ta-Nehisi Coates writes it for his son. It's clearly a tribute to the form, the style, <clears throat> and the subject of James Baldwin's writing, uh, which oftentimes was, was police violence. So Black writers have come back to James Baldwin, and, and, and I think, frankly, the Black Lives Matter movement has had a lot to do with it. Um, partly inspired me, you know, about 2013, when that movement was getting started, it, it made me want to go back and read James Baldwin, because <clears throat> uh, another theme in his writing is policing. Um, he, he, he wrote this very important essay in 1966, called A Report from Occupied Territory. And he said, if you're, if you're a Black person living in New York or Harlem or Philadelphia, the police are like a an occupying army in your neighborhood. And he was deliberately comparing them to an army to remind people that you know, the United States had an army in Vietnam that was occupying there. Um, so if you go back to James Baldwin and the police, wow, he's like, he was showing us what the Black Lives Matter movement was, was partly going to be about, right? Um, so in, an, in, a, in you know, legacies, <clears throat> legacies are very tricky things. And I would just say, if, a, if the 60s was one James Baldwin moment, the 2000 teens and the era of Black Lives Matter has been another James Baldwin moment. And, and here he is again, you know, we're reading him again to, <clears throat> to, to think about very important matters in our time. Um, on the question of his, his place in, you know, in, in say schools and public education, I taught in university for, for 30 years and, you know, Baldwin's definitely taught a lot in, in universities these days. I think uh, 
I think James Baldwin helped make, you know, African American studies as a as an academic field. When that field was coming into formation in the 70s and the 80s, James Baldwin was one of the writers that people said, we, we have to teach, we have to teach these books, right? Um, I think at the, at the high school and public school level, because I haven't really taught there, I, I think it's probably, as you say, not as clear. I think um, Baldwin is, is hard, you know, he's, he's a challenging writer. I think he should be taught in, in all the public schools. Um, one thing I tell my teacher friends to read is Baldwin gave a, a lecture called A Talk to Teachers about 1963. And it's an extraordinary lecture where he's talking to, to school teachers in places like Harlem. And he's saying, you know, you have this enormous chance and opportunity to understand how much you shape the lives of these young black children. And, um, and he says, you know, remember that these black children are growing up in a world that doesn't like them. And you need to help them work that out. You need to give them tools to understand why the world doesn't like black children. It's an amazing piece of work. And I would, I would recommend if I was teaching high school or even elementary school, I think you could teach that to students and it would be really interesting to see what they think. Do they think that the world has changed since 1963 when Baldwin said that? What do they think about their own education? You know, he really was, um, he, he, he should be taught in public schools because he wrote so much, especially about the lives of young people. I you know I mentioned, um, Go tell, it on, go tell it on the mountain, which is a what we call a coming of age story, right? It's about growing up. That's that's a great book to teach in uh, in, in in say a high school setting, right? So I, I do think um, because James Baldwin is back on everyone's radar, my my hope and my, my guess is that is that um, school teachers, you know. Um, across the board will continue to, to teach his work. There's also been in recent years, uh, a couple of beautiful films, uh, one particular biographical film by Raoul Peck, uh, which is this extraordinary. And all the, 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 the film is all with Baldwin's words, the entire narration and voiceover. Um, that, that film, I think, um, would be a wonderful teaching source too as an introduction to James Baldwin. Thank you. Uh, you're talking about that uh, documentary, it's not, I'm Not Your Negro, right? I Am Not Your Negro, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a and, su uh, superb film. Yeah, and a couple of uh, months ago, I just stumbled upon this documentary, James Baldwin's documentary in Paris. I think it was called In Another Country. It was just a 30 minute documentary. Yes. Yeah, it was also very good. fascinating, yeah. They're also very good. You know, if you go on YouTube, uh, there's a there's a short film that Baldwin. It was actually a television broadcast, 1963. Um, titles escaping me right now. It's Baldwin um, walking around San Francisco, the American city of San Francisco, just talking to black youth, teenagers about their lives and what they're feeling, and. Um, it's actually on YouTube. You can just pull it up and watch it. So that would be actually another great teaching source. If I was a public school teacher, just to see him engaging with children uh, and children talking about their own lives is really, really, really powerful. So there's all kinds of ways, I think, to, um, you know, to, to bring Baldwin to life for, for young people, especially. Well, thank you very, very much. It was a fascinating conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you so much, Mordez. I'm really appreciative to be here. And uh, uh, thank you for reading the book and uh, taking time to talk with me. Thank you.